be penalized. They were afraid, I call it being afraid to be black. And I don't know whether that makes sense to you guys, but uh, they thought that if they complained about something based on racial terms, that people would be looking at them differently and be complaining about them. And that's what struck me about that. And that, I and guess I, I was young and naive and, and at the point in my career and my life that I knew race, racism was a problem. And, and if you weren't going to call it, it would never get attention. And, but she, that, that was not where she was at that time. Yeah. And, and he was very, very, very segregated then. Yeah. And the consequences for, I guess, stepping out of line was so harsh back then. I could have understood what was going on back more than I understand what's going on today. Because today, Absolutely. some people are still like that, even though the consequences aren't as harsh as they used to be back then. But you're right. But the problem mm-hmm. it is absolutely that is the case. So and she exactly. would, I think she felt if she she if she did, she would lose her job. Right. Principal Holmes, you know, th- thanks for coming on You Be the Judge. And it's really exciting. One of the things I have a question, you know, when you talk about the age you grew up in and then we have to, how do you put into perspective when people talk about the good old days and the and the and the idea they and, and how they come at it? How do you talk to that and teach that part? Because it wasn't good old days for for many. No, it wasn't good old days for many. But in the sense of good old days, I can say that there, if I look at my life in that time in terms of the whole community and the world and the city that we lived in, we were very deprived. We were missing out on a lot. But I didn't know it at the time. And so... I could maybe say they were good old days because that's all I knew. But at this time in my life, I know that it was different. However, I will say this, that when it comes to education, I honestly do believe that my education in D.C. was better than or as, as, than any place else. I, and I have to say that. And, and I don't know why I say that, but other than many people came here to go to Dunbar High School. Mm-hmm. I, I know the kids, the parents who came here, they roomed with people, they lived with people, so they could go to Dunbar. Um, and I also felt like, even though it was segregated, that we had as much as the white schools did. And I didn't realize that until I was in college. And I went to minor teachers college and there was Wilson teachers college. Both of those schools merged. And when I was a senior, a junior, and they became, have now ultimately become the university of DC. But when I, when we merged those schools, I realized Mm -hmm. That Mina was very, de- how do I say this? Mina was not, did not have everything that Wilson had, but we had gigantic teachers that were there compared to the teachers that were at Wilson. And maybe that's what made the difference. So when people talk about segregation and, 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 the segregated time and desegregation hurt the black community. Can you speak to that and, and, and how did it hurt the black community or we didn't advance in or after segregation like we could have? I think it, let me begin by saying it did hurt the black community. And one of the things that I feel very strongly about is that children need experiences to help with the education. You can teach a child to read, but if it's not something to read about that they can tangibly Mm -hmm. look, feel, or touch, or have some kind of relationship with, that's a dip. I think that's depriving them. (coughs) Excuse me. But uh, I think kids need to have 
experiences and many of our kids do not have, still don't have, still don't have. because it isn't, and from my perspective, it isn't from, from my perspective, parents don't avail themselves of all the activities and all the things that they can do for kids that are free and inexpensive. And I realized that when I was a principal, it doesn't really cost other than transportation to take your kid into DC to, to see the monument, mm -hmm. to, to see um, the Black History Museum. To, but parents don't do that, and that troubles me. I have had many conversations with my parents about providing their kids with experiences. We ha I've seen kids go right through elementary school and never been out of Montgomery County. And that's unfortunate. Yeah, I don't understand that either. Because some, especially down here, there's certain places where you live where you have to pay to get into museums, you have to pay to go here, you have to pay to go there. But in this area, if you could pay for transportation, to get from where you're at, or sometimes you could even walk from one place to another. A lot of the museums, a lot mm -hmm. of the places of learning are open and free. And, and I, I just have to tell you, because uh, you remind me of principle tip number one, because I think that's my favorite principle, because I, I like to, uh, well, I believe in that as well. And let me read it for those who don't know, principle tip number one, uh, as we talked about in uh, Wilma Holmes's book, the Wilma Holmes story, Principles of Being a Principal, she has principal tips. And principal <coughs> tip number one is <coughs> excitement creates motivation. If you can find a way to reach to a struggling student's defeat, you could get them to change into the student you dream of. And that is so true. I, and I think that's what's missing in education nowadays they're the lesson lesson plans and you talk a lot about that and the different reasons for them uh and and some of the lesson plans nowadays don't necessarily relate to the lives of the students who are being taught those lesson plans so that the kids tune out but if you could get a child to uh, be tuned in and to be motivated if, if it's and you talk a lot as well about uh, doing hands-on activities with children because of, you know, some of them are very visual learners, they're tactile learners, and it's important to teach them in the way that they learn rather than in the way that you think that they should be taught. I, I, I found your yes. book fascinating, just really, really fascinating. Well, you know, I guess um, when I was student, when I was a student and that's why I say I had such powerful teachers. When I was doing my student teaching and training, I trained with some people that were just phenomenal teachers. And even today, I would take, I would put them there. They are just phenomenal. And my, mm -hmm. I can remember my teacher saying to me, the best thing you can do for your children is to make sure that you touch all bases with them the tactical, that the visual, the hearing, you make sure that you've touched them all because mm -hmm. all of the children don't learn the same way and you've got to be able to meet that need. And, and, and that always stuck with me. But let me just share a story with you that I didn't have in the book, I don't remember. But I used to, when I was at Flower Valley, you know, I encouraged teachers to take field trips with kids because... I just, again, feel like the experience is really very valuable. And um, I have paid the way for some parents to go. I would pay out of school funds to do that because I had some parents that had never been, never been in D.C. Wow. And, and then that's free and, and that it's and available to them. Um, and then the system now, and I don't know how many of you know this, but the system pays for kids to go to Strathmore. Every second grader and every fifth grader gets to go to Strathmore to a concert um, every year. The second wow. and fifth graders go. 
Um, and because it is such a valuable experience, learn how to act in the theater, how to and how to prepare for the going to the theater. Um, it's just, um, and those are perhaps because of coming up in a segregated world were skills that many black parents didn't put as in the forefront to to teach you or to make available to you. I, again, I have to say I was very fortunate. My mother was one of these people that was on top of all kinds of things. And we used to, my brother and I went to the theater once a month. We had to, at Armstrong High School in DC, they had children's plays during the winter. And we'd go there and that's when I, we started finding out about the theater. And so, but not everybody avails themselves of stuff like that. And that's what is missing in the lives of many, many children. So with the segregated time that's then and then we have the times we are now that is in quote segregated, but there's still a, such a divide. What, how do you see that divide either closing or is it going back to segregation? Well, I don't want to say it's going back, but I think it's, it hasn't moved forward. I'll put it that way. That's upsetting. Right. I would not say, but I don't think we are making gains. We are not. Uh, let me. <clears throat> I'm not sure how to put this, but I honestly believe the leadership at the in when I was in school was so committed to education rather than the job as superintendent that they were willing to everything that white kids did in the white school system, they made sure that black school system had it too. And, and, and I personally know that they challenged the overall superintendent who was white to make sure that and whatever they did for white schools that they would do for black schools. And that's why I think that black schools in D.C., really did have as much as, as anybody else. But that's not always the case. And so that's why I say is you can't use that as a measure because I think that really is dependent upon personality. Um, for instance, in Montgomery County Public Schools, I've been, I was in Montgomery County Public Schools almost 50 years and I saw that system change, grow, improve, and then retrogress. And now the test scores are terrible. Now, I don't think you base everything on test scores, but, but the test scores is a measure that a school system is judged on. And it's, so I, you know, I don't know what you, call, what you say to that other than I think we hire people who are not absolutely teacher trained. If you got a college degree, they will hire you and then try to train you. Um, we have a lot of folks that came out of college, have a four year degree and they get, can get hired. And then they say, you'll go to training. Well, I think that makes a difference. Um, that's not answering your question, but. I, I think it did, but I want to go back a little bit about uh, uh, to Paul's question, uh, because it seems to me from reading your book that you and your parents and, and your family, you, you were very well protected. And, and where you lived that you were very well educated. When you became a teacher and you had to teach in other parts of the District of Columbia, you were like, oh, my goodness, these kids didn't have what I had when I was a child. And I think that's, that's exactly. one of the things that uh, Paul was getting at. My first year teaching, Marilyn, let me tell you, when I was, when I, the first year I was teaching, I had a new baby and I went to the superintendent, the assistant superintendent, 
And my mother-in-law, who was very good friends with them, um, but anyway, I, she said, I don't think it makes any sense that you don't, I don't think you'll do much good, but you go and ask anyway. So I went and I said, I'll take my baby because everybody loves babies. And mm -hmm. so maybe that'll help. So I dressed up my little Ricky and I went to see them and they just loved the baby. And I still didn't get what I wanted. I was trying to get closer to home. And she's fine. She honestly said to me, these are her paraphrasing her words. You have lived such a, 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 um, a special kind of life. You have had everything going for you. You need to know what the other side of the world lives like. And you can't teach unless you know about everybody. And so she said, I think this is an experience that you need to have. And she wouldn't change me. Mm -hmm. And she was right. She was right. She was absolutely right. Because I had never known anybody that didn't have a winter coat. I had never known anybody that had uh, had to wear the backs of their shoes down because they didn't have shoes to fit them. I had never in my life known that. And the first year I was teaching, that's what I met. Mm -hmm. And so that first Christmas, I went to all my friends, my mother's friends, my, my grandparents. I went to everybody collecting coats and shoes and I had uh, baskets of stuff to chat for kids. And when one of my little kids came back to school in January with the same sweater on and it was cold as it could be. And I said, what happened to your new coat? And she said, my mama pawned it. She needed money. Oh, I, that just, I mean, I cannot tell you what that did to me. So that, and, and that, that grows on you, honey. That mm -hmm. makes, changes you. It really does. So I'm sure that has had something to do with the direction of my life. Because I just could not stand to see that when it was something that I could do about it. If you can imagine a second grader with no winter coat, wow. it's, it brings tears to my eyes when I think about it right now. Mm -hmm. It was in the dead of winter. Okay. But, but these were people that were where it was alcohol and drug infested. And, you know, I don't know whether she had to, because of food, but uh, but I had my school always did Thanksgiving baskets. Every class did two or three baskets, and we filled them up at Thanksgiving time. But nobody did that at Christmas time, and and so I worked so hard to get it all together. But then I be, went back to my chapter of Delta at that time to ask them for help for the school, for, to look at the school community and see how we might help there. <coughs> yeah, uh, that, I mean, that's really, really sad, which brings me to one of the reasons why I like principle number five, uh, what principle tip five so much. Uh, it reads, never condemn a student unless you fully understand the context mm -hmm. of their actions and their history. Students don't generally mean to be naughty or disruptive. They may never have had exposure to limits or restrictions. They may feel their actions are warranted. Always go for rehabilitation over punishment. Because in, in certain situations in the book, you could have just gone to punishment, but then you prefer to listen and have the child take responsibility for his or her actions. And I, I like the part where some of the parents alluded to while well, you having them confess <laughs> the things, but you thought that part of part of them saying this is what I did to get in this situation was for them to take self-responsibility. Right. Well, I, you know, whenever I had a situation with kids, I would always say, start your son and tell me what happened, but I want you to tell me what you did. Not what anybody else did. Just tell me what you did. 
And it's really hard for little kids to do that because they're so used to saying, well, Tommy hit me first or they this, that, and And I said, uh-uh, that's not what I want to know. I want to know, what did you do? Mm-hmm. And I, But I practiced that with my kids, my own kids. I would always have chastised them and by saying, tell me what you did, and then I will find out about the rest. That's all I want to know. That's what I'm concerned with. And I think, but I do think that builds responsibility. Uh, you know, I learned that the hard way, Marilyn. When I was at Flower Valley, the first time I was at, when I first went to Flower Valley, I had some fifth grade boys who tied legs together on the playground to do a three-legged um, walk or something. I don't know what they were doing. They had tied kids' legs together. And one of them fell and broke a leg. Ooh. And so, you know, I was trying to get a handle on what happened. And I started off by saying, tell me what happened. And all of a sudden it dawned on me, you know what, they're not taking any responsibility for this. And I stopped them midstream and said, you know what, I don't want to know what happened like that. I just want to know what you did. And so that was really, that's when the parent chastised me and said I was making them confess to something that <coughs> that didn't really happen, that they didn't do or something like that. And I made, from that point on, I made kids call home and say, I did so-and-so. And that's why I'm in the principal's office. So- I decided it was better to do that. Then I sent a note to follow it. But they called their parents and said, I'm in the principal's office. My teacher sent me there or the playground aide sent me there because I did so and so and so and so. And that's when parents started saying I was making kids confess. Well, call it what you may. <laughs> when it comes to edu- when it comes to education, and I'm sh- and I'm not sure, are you hyper focused on watching how education is being dismantled or how it's being taught? But when we get to the words called critical race theory or things that are being taught that was in the past, how do you feel it? Sh- do you think it should be taught, or do you think it needs to be taught? I think it needs to be taught. I think we are doing a disservice to kids by taking things out of the book. (coughs) I think that those are lessons that you need to learn. And it also puts in perspective why there needs to be change. Um, There are so many folks that don't have the first clue about how many black folks have suffered in this country. They don't have a clue about the barriers that you overcame to get what you have because they don't have that struggle. They don't have a struggle. They can walk in any place and it, and they look at them and they're over, over the barrel. You walk in there and immediately you got to get through to them looking at your color and they don't understand that. And I think we have to keep reminding them of that. <coughs> And after Donald Trump, we're going to be reminding folks for a long time. Yeah, you say that prejudice is a learned behavior. And you also talked about how in the Montgomery County public school system, you see that there is a regression in terms of advances made by the children. What is it that is being taught now in terms of prejudice that wasn't being taught before when the children were making progress? Well, you know, for instance, they don't, they don't acknowledge and, and, and teach the holidays. For instance, they, they slide right over Washington's um, birthday, Lincoln's birthday. If you're going to celebrate Lincoln's birthday as a president, you get a holiday for that. Why don't you explain that Lincoln was the president who who freed the slaves? They don't mention that. That's not that's not an issue. Kids don't even know what you're talking. Some some white kids, if you ask them right now, they don't even know what a slave is. 
you at, at, and and first grade kindergarten when I was in school, you knew very right away when the reason you were celebrating Abraham Lincoln was he had freed the slaves. <clears throat> but and I'm oversimplifying that. I'm just but I'm saying that that that's the kind of thing that they're cutting out that they don't give time to. They don't, they just recognize it as a holiday, but they don't talk about why. Um, we don't give the time of day to why we celebrate Veterans Day anymore. You know, it's a holiday, but those, uh, uh, to me, those are important kinds of learnings. And that is also the kind of learning that leads to inquiry and kids' ability to to inquire and to think and to promote thinking skills because then you you know I don't want kids to take what I say to them as the last word what I hope when I say to them leads them to want to know more and to ask questions and to think beyond that how that applies to something else um if you got, if you were punished in school, uh, had an accident or something in school, and you had were reprimanded for it, what did you learn from that? Did you learn that it hurt somebody's feelings? Did you learn that um, it hurt somebody physically? How would you make sure that you didn't do that again? Which is what is more important to me than what you actually did. What did you learn from it? I got it. Yeah. And- uh, what, oh, sorry. Oh, oh, I was just going to say that your <clears throat> uh, your self responsibility went to a level that I I have never heard of before, which is when you were when you agreed to do Ricky's detention for her because you said you were the one at fault, and that's why. Can you ex- can you tell that story? Because I find that story extremely amusing, and like I said. Self-responsibility to a higher level. You do practice what you preach. (laughs) Okay, well, my Sharon, my youngest daughter, has... You have two daughters. Yes, I have two daughters. The youngest one is Sharon. Sharon. Mm -hmm. And she's a lawyer, but she lives in in Michigan. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. When she was in the 12th grade, She had an asthma attack just about this time of year. We both do. I gave it to her. You know, I guess it is a gene. I don't know what happened. But anyway, when she was out sick and she was at Holy Cross uh, High School. And that's another story I'll tell you about why they were in Catholic school. Um, But she, I called school that Monday and said, Sharon has had an asthma attack. And she will be out of school the week, I am sure. Okay. When she went back to school the following Monday, the, the principal told her she had detention because her mother didn't call every day. And the, book, book, the rule in the book says, your mother is supposed to call every day. Well, Sharon was first fit to be tied. She was just fit to be tied that because she took, she couldn't understand that I had already called. But anyway, but the other reason she was fit to be tied was Holy Cross did not offer a course in chemistry that she needed. And she had to leave school every day to go to Georgetown Prep to take the course. And so she had to leave and they wouldn't let her leave. They told her she couldn't go. So of course she calls me and she's, I could hardly make out what she was saying because she was like fit to be tied. Mm -hmm. And um, so I said, all right, Sharon, just hold on. I will come down there and see what was going on. So I left my office drove down Brockville Pike and went in to see her and the nun. And the teacher, the nun says to me, well, you see right here, 
it says mothers must call every day if your child is going to be absent. So I said, well, no, I did not do that. I called on Monday and I did not realize that was a rule. But if that is the rule, then I made the mistake. Sharon didn't. So she does not have to do detention. I will do detention. And every day I went, I picked my mo- my mail file up and went to her school and did detention for the whole week. <laughs> One of the things I wanted to say is that we don't often get a chance to listen to our elders. And I know for me, my mother has passed, my grandmothers have passed, my my immediate elders are, are gone. And listening to you is not just a refreshing for me, but it actually, it, it I have such a deep emotion listening to my <laughs> elders talk and give us not just a story, but the education we have missed in our community so desperately. And I just want to say thank you for sharing your time with us, Principal Holmes, and giving us that, for me, it's that sense of home, you know, and it, it just, it, it, I, I can't, I'm unable to put it into words. Words sometimes don't really fit the bill, but I, I am just so overwhelmed with listening to and having you here on this earth and this planet. I just want to say thank you. Oh, thank you for saying that. I appreciate that very, very much. I, <clears throat> I'm, I apologize. I'm just coming out of a asthma attack, as I said to you earlier. So my voice is coming and going, and I apologize for that. But I certainly appreciate your saying that. I, I wish that the, there are some things that I think that uh, we have experienced that we should share with share more and i i the reason i wrote the book and i'll be really honest with you is my two daughters said to me mommy you got to write a book and i said no and so one of the reasons they did that is they kept saying i was bored because i kept saying i'm so bored i don't have anything to do i don't and my oldest daughter said mommy please (laughs) (coughs) So, but both of them, uh, uh, I'm very proud of both of my two girls. And, and I do think that I passed on to them the, the need to be responsible for their own behavior. And I think they have passed that on to their kids. I am very blessed to have been able to be here long enough to have three great grandchildren. So I'm, um, and the oldest one of them is in kindergarten this year. So I'm just delighted that I've been able to see that. It, it, yeah. we're, hold real quick before you get, we're coming up on an election and I want to put this in there. And Maryland is on the precipice of maybe having the first black governor ever. And, right. And, and now that you have been from a segregated area that you grew yeah. up in, and taught in Montgomery in in Maryland for 50 years. What does that, what does that generate in you? And how do you see this ever? How do you see it? Well, first of all, I am just delighted. I never thought I would ever see the day that that would happen. I never thought I'd see a black president either, but I did. And I'm, I feel very blessed about that. But I also feel extremely blessed to see this happen. I happen to know both um, of the people involved and Aruna worked for my husband when she was an engineer. So I know they are very qualified to do the job. I am delighted to know that. But as I have to be honest with you, I never ever expected to see this in my lifetime. Um, I truly... um, But I also say they, too, have had some experiences that make them better qualified for the job. They, too, have bring with them a knowledge that they have to share and 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 live with to make this a better place. And I do think that will happen. And that, that's one of the things about you as well. Not only are you well-known in the education field, you're also well-known in the political field. You have 
well, someone you are extremely familiar with who is running uh, uh, at the state level as well. Yes. And, yes. And who is that? Oh, that's my my son, my grandson in law's sister, Brooke Learman, is running for comptroller. So we said you had two daughters, Ricky and Sharon. Right. Uh, Ricky's and daughter, Amanda, is married to, to Brooke's brother, Kyle. Right. Kyle Learman, who is Brooke Learman's brother. Right, right, mm -hmm. right. Um, but I'm very happy with Brooke. She too is very qualified. Um, um, I, Lord knows I didn't plan this and I didn't know this, but my um, Ricky went to Dartmouth and Amanda went to Dartmouth and Brooke went to Dartmouth. So it's funny. And they didn't know, Brooke didn't know them at that time, but that's, mm -hmm. You know, that's another tie there, but um, Kyle is Manda's husband. So I hope that that will, um, I hope she'll man it, will win. She's very capable and will be a, a, a pleasant change. Yes, that's true. And they gave you your three great, great granddaughters. Three great grandchildren, that's right. And they're just amazing kids. They're just so smart and healthy and beautiful. We're just very happy that you have been so blessed. Right, that I truly am. I would. I wish I'd had Belle here with me. The, the, she's um, <laughs> she's such a, a a shining little star, you know. And I don't say that because she's mine, but she is just. If there was ever a ball of protoplasm that could be formed and made what you want she is it she is just just soaking up the education and the experiences and just can talk about them she can think you know as at five years old she's putting things together and it just that's what you want you know i i work so hard to help kids and to get teachers to work with kids so that they could learn to think Mm -hmm. Well, you know, um, I just wanted to, to share that uh, while we're on the topic of voting, early voting in Maryland begins tomorrow. Exactly, tomorrow. Yes, Thursday to Thursday. Uh, November 8 is General Election Day. And uh, people have the opportunity to get to the polls and exercise their right to vote. Absolutely. And that is a and wonderful it's thing. That is the most important thing you own is your right to vote. It is. It is. You know, and, and don't forget down ballots um, because it's, it's not just about the governor, but it's about uh, local officials, county council Absolutely. people, uh, uh, senators. Because those are the people who impact your daily life. That's right. That's right. They right. impact how, mu how many times garbage is collected in your neighborhood, how That's many light right. bulbs are in your street. How many street light bulbs, street lights are in your neighborhood? <laughs> and uh, they also control affordable housing and, and where that gets built. Uh, they also control who's the police chief. They also right. control um, who serves on the, uh, in some instances, on the police accountability board, uh, right. the administrative charging committee. All of that. And they also control the budget for the school system. Budget for the school system. Absolutely. Right. Uh -huh. And so, you know, certain people understand power and they know how to and they, they use it. You know, they're not afraid to use it. And see, we need to right. be more in that direction rather than just, you know, just kind of take yeah. it all. all we have a lot of educating to do um, in our community to get them to understand that it isn't and that you can do something about it. I think we have so many people that I talk to that are just defeated about it. Why bother? It's not going to, you know, you, it is what it is. And, and, you know, it doesn't have to be, it is what it is. That's right. Change that. And, and then some people don't vote because they say, um, it's not going to change anything. No, that's the wrong attitude. That's Wrong right. That attitude. One vote can make a big difference. That's right. That's exactly right. 
Prince Principal one Holmes, vote can make a big difference. Principal, Principal Holmes, do you think people voted more in your younger years than now? And how come? Is it because of the well, apathy? I'm not a good candidate to answer that question because in D.C., we didn't have the right to vote. I, when I lived in D.C., I had we couldn't vote then at all. And they have limited voting even now. Uh, but I could not vote. My parents couldn't vote when they in D.C. My mother didn't get to vote until she was um, about 65 years old because my father died and we moved her to Maryland closer to us. And so she had not ever voted until she was 65. <coughs> and I, and I, of course, moved to Maryland a lot sooner than that and began a able to vote. But as a kid, until I was in my 30s, I never voted. So I'm not, you know, I understand what you're saying, but um, but when I got a chance to vote, I jumped at it. I was like, wow, I can do this. But a lot of folks don't see the vote as, as a precious thing. I guess I felt it was so precious because I never had it before, too. And that's, you know, that's what made... <coughs> Uh, you know, and, and I've said to my kids all the time, voting is the reason I have a salary. Voting is the reason your father has a salary. You got to vote. It's important. Don't miss it. And when my kids turned 18, I was about getting them to vote. Yeah, and now that people could register to vote before they turned 18 in Maryland... You know, when my kids turned 16, they were registered to vote. And, right. you know, and, and you have to do that. Voting is a learned behavior. And exactly. if you grow up seeing your parents vote and being engaged and they explain to you why they vote and why that's so important, when you grow up, you're likely to, to vote. But if you grow up and, you know, your parents didn't vote for whatever reason, Look at how much was in the news, I think about two weeks ago, about the governor of Florida uh, sending the police on people who have voted and get and arresting mm -hmm. them right then and there. You know, people hear stories like that and they said, oh, I'm not going to bother vote, voting because I don't want to put myself out there and find myself in a situation where I'm getting to be put in prison because I voted. So we, we have to educate people. We have to encourage people and get them to vote because that is really, really important. And I cannot let you go without quoting my favorite person beside you, you know, Thurgood Marshall, which you have in your book. And uh, you quote Thurgood Marshall as saying, the measure of a country's great greatness is its ability to retain compassion in times of crisis. And that, that is so important because especially nowadays, we're hearing that crime is going up. We've got to you know, be tough on crime and so on and so forth. Yes, everybody wants to be safe. However, no matter how many times the research has shown that that tough on crime rhetoric doesn't really work, it doesn't keep us safe, we still keep hearing it. And people just want to lock up people just well, because it makes them feel better, frankly, and, and might even put money in their pockets since uh, we have a, a prison industrial complex that is listed on the stock exchange <laughs> and we incarcerate so many of, of our people uh, as compared to other countries. So wow. we really have got to look at what is going on here and vote. And not only vote, but hold the people who are in office accountable, whether you vote for them or not, because they don't know if you voted for them. They just know you voted. So that's and, right. And whether you voted for them or not, you're still paying for them. So you might as well make sure that they do the job that you're paying them to do. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. You want to show that book one more time, Marilyn, and where people can buy it and, and order it? Oh, wait. Uh, this um, is well, I will not home and as I said, it's called the Wilma Home Store. Well, it's called the Big Home. It is, it, 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 it has a rating of 4.9 out of 5 on Amazon. And I don't know where, I, I know I got my special autograph copy from the office. 
you know, with a very, very nice dedication. So, <laughs> 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 so but well, uh, Principal Holmes, where can people get your book? It, it can be on, 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 on Amazon. Mm-hmm. It's on Amazon and it's easy to reach. It's easy to get. Right. And I appreciate you doing that. That's very nice of you, Marilyn, to pub, uh, to uh, make that available, information available. Let me just say one more thing to you guys. I appreciate so much you having me on today. Um, I feel like I have a voice that I want to make sure people hear just because I've, I went from being totally segregated and in a little box to a big box but still see the need for, for still feel segregated and that's what I, I I just think that's important segregation when I when I was born was different than it is now but we really are still segregated and even though all kinds of things have opened up around us, we still are. And there are some things that happen that will have to happen to make us feel whole beyond voting. Yes, that's true. I like the part in your book where you talked about some people might say that I'm an angry black woman because I talk (coughs) about race, but I'm, you know, I'm angry and I'm, Black, and you didn't say it, but you are a woman, as far as I know. <laughs> right. uh, but it doesn't make you um, feel the stereotype. Sometimes a lot of people think that, oh my gosh, she's another person talking about race again. You know, can't they see the progress that have been made? Can't they recognize that and be grateful for it? Do you want to right. talk about why you felt it was important to talk about race and continue to talk about race even in, in this day and age? Well, because I still see things happen to people that would not have happened if we were free of segregation and Mm -hmm. free of racism. Yeah, I couldn't believe what happened to you when you went to the restaurant. uh, Was it a couple? Was it last year? Absolutely. Yeah, do you want to tell that story? That, That was like, wow. Yes, I went to a restaurant just since I've been retired with some teachers from my, from the Flower Valley staff. And I was of course the only black person there. And the waiter went to everybody but me. And I was the last one he went to. And he skipped over me to go to other people. But you know what? I honestly, I have to tell you the one good thing about that is I think I've had an impact on those folks that were there because they noticed it before, as well as me. So to me, that is, that's a plus because I can remember the time when they would never have noticed that. Mm-hmm. Would, and would you- we get people recognizing and understanding and noticing what's racism, we're going to always have it with us. I, I know you explained the reasons why you didn't say anything, but do you think you would have preferred it had they said something? Mm, I, yeah, maybe so. Mm. Maybe so. Mm-hmm. I, 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 I didn't I, say anything. I, I, I would, I would but, and, I, and, and then I don't know. I didn't realize that they didn't say anything. I mean, I knew they didn't say anything, but I didn't realize that they had noticed it until after the fact. And one of them said to me, I saw that. I knew that. Mm. But, okay. you know, we, we had said this on the show. When, when good people say nothing, it, 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 um, it, it's, they still let it be okay. You know, yeah, good, that's people, right. good people have to say something. Go ahead, Holly. Yeah, and, you know, part of this, the other thing is that there are some white folks that really – want to be um, fair and don't want to be seen as racist, but they it's innate in them. They, if they grew up in a culture and it's a part of them. And if you don't call it, they never will recognize it. Mm. 
and you have to call it. You have to say that was not right, and that and this should have been. And and many white folks are grateful for you saying that. Others are not. But I, when I can, I usually call it. Mm -hmm. <coughs> and if I can't call it on the spot, I will call it afterwards and go back to it because I think it's very important. And that's why I said that I don't want to be seen as an angry black woman. And then on the other hand, maybe I do want to be seen that way because I am, I don't think I'm angry, but I think I am determined to work at the issue because it's going to be there my lifetime. And I don't, I don't, I hate the thoughts of leaving this world and it not uh, better. Yeah, and you have definitely made the world better. I, I love this book. I, I cannot tell you how much I love the, the book enough. And I know we talked a lot about serious issues, but there are really some funny, funny stories in this book from when you, you corrected the spelling on a Jim Crow sign <coughs> because they did not spell the word water properly. They had colored oh, yeah. water and white water. Yeah, I was, I think I was about 14. No, I maybe was 16. Yeah, I was mm -hmm. 16 when I did that. So I had sense enough to know I was doing something crazy, but <laughs> it never dawned on me that they could have locked me up. I don't know why I thought I couldn't get locked up. <coughs> oh, before we but put I up... Before we cut off the live show, I just want to let everybody know you listen to You Be The Judge. We're here every Wednesday from 6 p.m. to 7 p.m. Every Wednesday at 6 p.m. You can always catch the show on any of all your podcast channels or your iHeart. Just put in You Be The Judge and with it Bridges Live and it would pop on up. So thank you. Um, before we'll, cut, we'll continue our conversation, but we'll cut the recording and we cut the live broadcast.